Hello, mathematicians. This is Jade Flores Henderson here. I am an economist doing a guest lecture for Skewed Script. And we're going to be talking about the minimum wage and systems of linear equations. So let's skew it. So today we're going to be talking about solving linear systems of equations using any method. This is algebra lesson 3.3. So there's been a lot of discussion recently about moving the minimum wage from the current level of $7.25 per hour up to $15 per hour. However, some economists warn that raising the minimum wage could have some consequences, right? And those consequences could impact low wage workers. So today we're going to be talking about should we raise the minimum wage? If you want to follow along the lesson today, you can go to this link and you can download the, the notes alongside and work along with us. So first, let's talk a little bit about framing this debate. So imagine that you're working a full-time job that's eight hours per day, five days a week, and the job pays the current federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour. All right, let's figure out how much money we would make in a week and then in a year. So we could take our eight hours a day times our five days a week to see that we're working 40 hours per week, right? That's considered full-time work. If we take that 40 hours per week, or I'm sorry, 40 hours per, yes, 40 hours per week and multiply it by our $7.25 per hour, we could figure out how much money we're going to make in the week. And we could see that we're going to end up making $290 each week. If we take that and figure out what we're going to make in a year, we could take that $290 per week and multiply it by the number of weeks in a year, which is 52. And we would see that we would be making $15,080 per year. So just over $15,000. Now, what if we were working that full-time job, but now we're working with a $15 minimum wage? So again, we're gonna take our 40 hours per week, we're gonna multiply it by now $15 per hour, and we're gonna see that we're gonna be making $600 per week now. Again, if we wanna see what that would be per year, we take that $600 per week, we multiply it by 52 weeks in the year, and we see that we'd be making $31,200 per year, so a little over $31,000. So what we're going to do is see what a livable wage really means. MIT has a livable wage calculator, right? And we're gonna use uh, this link to get there. What we're going to do is we're going to find the typical expenses section of the livable wage calculator and we're going to find the required annual income before taxes for just us. So we're going to look at a livable wage for one adult, no children. And we're going to see would the current minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, would it meet that livable wage income? And then we'll see what about the $15 minimum uh, wage, would that meet the livable income? All right, so this here is MIT's living wage calculator. Right? You can look it up in your location, but we're going to look up San Antonio, Texas. Now, when we talk about a livable wage, what we mean is how much you would need to be making to just be covering your basic needs, right? So just paying for the expenses that cover those basic needs, food, shelter, etc. This is not including any luxuries like going out to eat, um, any kind of entertainment, going to the movies, things like that. This is just the bare minimum of what you need in order to uh, fulfill those basic needs uh, in your location. So again, we're going to look for just us. So we're going to look at one adult, zero children, right? Here's our typical expenses. We're going to go all the way down to the bottom where it says required annual income before taxes. So in San Antonio, Texas, it would take $32,100 to just be meeting the basic expenses for just an adult, no children. So we saw that in San Antonio, Texas, it would take a little over $32,000 a year to be meeting that livable wage uh, level. So we just just barely miss it with the $15 an hour minimum wage, right? So we're, we're just under at $31,200, right? But we're certainly a lot closer than we were the, with the $7.25 per hour. Right, we're more than more than double in this case, and just barely, uh, just barely under that livable wage limit. All right, so it seems like a no-brainer, right? Just raise the minimum wage. Right? But some people right, argue otherwise. 
So here we have the CEO of Dunkin' Donuts, right? And uh, we're going to hear what he has to say about being required to raise the minimum wage for workers. Um, we've always been a supporter of reasonable increases in the minimum wage. You know, we think the minimum wage actually stimulates the economy. We think it's good for low, middle income uh, employees and, and people in those categories. We think that a debate needs to take place about how to tackle income inequality. But this is absolutely uh, outrageous. The increase is 71% that's proposed over three years. Yes, 71%. And we tried to enter into the debate. The industry wasn't allowed to have a voice in it. Um, this is going to affect small business. This is going to affect franchisees. This is the, basically the fuel of growth in our economy. I think it's actually going to hurt young people. Uh, the unemployment rate among 16 to 19 year olds in New York State is 20.8%. Um, obviously, we're going to do everything we can to mitigate, and, and part of the mitigation may be employing less people. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, All right, so what the CEO said here is that he's going to do everything he can uh, to mitigate the rising costs for the business. And part of that mitigation might be that they have to employ fewer people. Right? So it may be the case that they can't, can't afford to hire as many people as they could before. Right. So could raising the minimum wage end up making some people lose their job? So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a system of equations to look at this problem. So let's imagine a Dunkin' Donuts that's located in a town where there's 100 people looking for work in the fast food industry. So 100 potential workers for Dunkin' Donuts. Now, if the store says that it's going to pay workers $3 an hour, how many people are going to apply? Probably no one. Right. $3 an hour is just got, not going to be enough for people. Right? They're going to be able to find more money working elsewhere. However, if the store says that it's going to pay workers $200 an hour, now how many people would apply? Probably everyone. Right? Probably all 100 people are going to say that that $200 is worth it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, we're going to look at some linear equations. We're going to consider the y variable to be the hourly wage at Dunkin Donuts. And the X variable is going to be the number of people who are going to be working there, who want to work there. And we're going to go ahead and plot this uh, on a graph. So let's imagine this relationship here. Y is equal to 2X plus 3. So the hourly wage equals 2 times the number of people who would work at Dunkin' Donuts plus 3. So we can go ahead and plot this line. Right? And this line is going to have a positive slope. Right? That makes sense because when there is a higher wage being offered, more people are going to want to work at the business. Right? So as the business is going to pay more, more people work there, right? therefore X and Y are increasing together. Right? So that's the definition of a positive slope. So now let's think about it from the perspective of the store. Right? So this blue line is from the perspective of the people who would want to work at Dunkin' Donuts. Now let's look at it from the store's perspective. So the Y variable is still going to be our hourly wage, right? but now our X variable is going to be the number of people that Dunkin' Donuts can afford to hire. Not how many people want to work there, but how many people they are going to be able to hire. So let's imagine this relationship here, Y equals negative X plus 18. So the wage equals the negative the number of people who Dunkin' can afford to hire plus 18. Again, we can go ahead and plot that line on our graph. So th this line has negative slope. Right. Again, that makes sense. Right? As the wage increases, the business is not going to be able to afford to hire as many people as they were in the past. Right? So this time, our X variable and Y variable are moving in opposite directions. They're negatively related. That's the definition of a negative slope. So in economics, we call this our labor supply curve and labor demand curve. So the labor supply curve is our blue line. That's how many workers are going to be willing to work at a particular place given a variety of different wages. And then the red line is from the business's perspective. That's our labor demand curve. So that's how much business the labor demands, meaning how much they are willing and able to hire at a variety of different wages. Now, in a free market, meaning there's no interference in the economy, there's no restrictions being placed on it, the number of people who are going to end up employed are going to be is going to be determined by where these lines meet, where the labor supply curve meets the labor demand curve, right? That intersection point, right? And that's considered our equilibrium number of people that are going to be employed. 
And so let's go ahead and solve our system of equations, right, in order to figure out what that equilibrium would be. So just by looking at our graph, it looks like these lines are intersecting at five comma 13. So five people working at $13 per hour, right? Just, just from looking, that's what it seems like, right? But we're gonna go, wanna go ahead and uh, calculate it mathematically so we can be sure. So we can do this in a couple ways. Let's start off with substitution, right? So because both of these equations right, are set equal to y, we can take one of them and plug it in for the y in the other equation, right? So if we do that, if we substitute in our 2x plus 3, that's going to give us 2x plus 3 equals negative x plus 18, right? And now we just have a single variable equation uh, where we can combine our variables to solve. So we're going to add our x, our negative x, over to the other side of the equation. That's going to leave us with 3x plus 3 equals 18, right? And then we're going to get the 3 over to the other side of the equation, and we're going to be left with 3x equals 15. Our last step is to divide through by 3, and that's going to leave us with x equals 5. Right? So, so far so good with our estimate. Now, in order to figure out what our y value is going to be, we can take that 5 and plug it back in for one of our x's. You can do it into either equation, right? Let's go ahead and plug it in for our x in our y equals 2x plus 3. So when we plug that in, we're going to be left with y equals 2 times 5 plus 3, right? So our order of operations says we multiply our 2 and 5 first. So we have y equals 10 plus 3, add those together, and we get y equals 13, right? So, so far, so good. Um, we could verify this by plugging it into either equation and see that the solution holds true. All right, so that does verify our estimate for our intersection point. So five people working, $13 an hour. Let's do the same thing using elimination as our, as our method of solving our equations. So we're going to go ahead and take our two equations, stack them together. All right, we're going to subtract them from one another. When we do that, the y's are going to cancel out. We're going to be left with 0 equals 3x plus 15. So again, now we just have a single variable equation. Now that we've gotten rid of the y's, we can take our 15 and add it over to the other side of the equation. We're going to have 15 equals 3x, and we can divide through by our 3 in order to be left with our 5 equals x. So again, so far so good. That matches what our prediction was and what we saw with our other method of solving. And now we can take that 5, plug it back into either one of the equations, and see that we get, uh, we get 13 once again. Right? So intersection at 5, 13. So five workers being hired at $13 an hour. Right? So we verified that solution with both methods of elimination. Right? Now let's go ahead and imagine that the federal minimum wage now has been risen to $15 uh, an hour. So now the businesses are required to pay $15 to each worker per hour. We can again plot that by just showing a horizontal line at y equals 15 on our graph. So the new number of employees that Duncan can afford to hire, right, we can see where the red line intersects our green line and see that at $15 an hour, the store has the capacity to hire three people. Okay. <clears throat> However, uh, previously, with no restriction placed on the market, they were able to hire five, and at a $15 an hour wage, uh, the number of people willing to work for Duncan is going to be six. And you can see the intersection between the, uh, the green and the blue would be six, right? So this three workers is lower than what Dunkin' Donuts was able to afford to hire before the minimum wage was put in place. So let's talk about this a little bit. So in raising the minimum wage, there's been a bit of a trade-off, right, which there always is with economic issues. So we did increase the wages of the people who have jobs. So the people who continue to work throughout the, the raise of the minimum wage, they are going to be making more money per hour. However, it may be the case that in raising the minimum wage, some of the workers end up losing their jobs or people who don't have a job have a hard, harder time finding one. So think about this, discuss it with your classmates. Right. In your opinion, should we raise the minimum wage? Right. Is that a benefit? Is that going to be a benefit to people? Right. So make sure that you explain how you how you're thinking about this using the analysis that we just did. Right. So thinking about the trade off that we introduced here, looking at the solution to the equations that we worked with, and seeing 
what uh, what happened when we imposed that $15 an hour wage, right? Take all that into consideration, think about it, and discuss with your classmates.